Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our third seminar of the 2015 convention. Good to see a really good turnout this morning. Of course, I knew there would be. Uh, this is going to be a great one. As you all know, Ed Hurdle is uh, one of the leading uh, collectors and uh, experts and illegals in our hobby. He's from Texas. He's doing one on uh, Benny Binion and the Dal Dallas Wars. Uh, in addition to being that knowledgeable, in my opinion, Ed is also one of the nicest people in our hobby. And uh, so with, won't delay it any longer, here's Ed Hurdle. Thanks, Jim. Um, so today I wanted to talk about Benny Binion. Uh, one thing, I, I think everybody here probably knows a lot more about Benny than I do, um, especially with his Las Vegas times. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what the education level of Benny was. I figured it'd be pretty high, but uh, last week I was playing poker. I had six guys and told them I was going to be here doing this, and uh, they said, you know, what are you doing it on? And I said, you know, Benny Benny and, and his Dallas days, and they're like, you know, who? I was like, oh, no. So then I came here, and I'm starting to talk to some people and telling them I'm going to do Benny, and they had the most obscure facts about the guy, like they knew everything about him. So I'm not quite sure what the level of interest in Benny is, but one thing I'm probably pretty sure of that his days in Dallas are his least known thing. And um, it's, I think it's terribly interesting, of course, being an illegal guy, it's really my main interest. Um, so I'm going to pretty much stick to his Dallas days on this. We'll go to Vegas a little bit as he goes, but I'm going to concentrate mostly on Dallas because I think that's what most people know the least about. So. All right, well, let's get started. Um, Benny Binion, of course, most people know him as the cowboy of Las Vegas. Um, when you think about him, you think of a cowboy. He's, you know, with his physical appearance, he's always got the big cowboy hat, the, uh, the jacket, no tie. He's always smiling. Um, another thing that most people know about him is he's a, a no limits kind of guy. Um, he takes no fear on taking bets, I think. It's been said whether you want to bet a dollar or a million dollars at the horseshoe, he's going to take your action. Um, that's one of the things he's known for, and that's also one thing that ties back to his uh, Dallas days. Uh, another thing, he's a straight shooter. Um, you know, mostly about his honesty, but also what we're going to find out is also with his gun, he's, he's, uh, he's a pretty good shooter. He's known to be uh, terribly honest. He runs a clean game. Um, and he really cares about his reputation, at least when it comes to gambling. Um, he's known as a pioneer. He, uh, you know, he pretty much transformed downtown from these small sawdust places to really a gambling destination, mostly with the, the whales and his, uh, you know, his, his ability to take any action. But uh, what most people don't know is he, uh, well, what, what most of the biographies will say is in the first you know, a couple sentences he'll say he was a former Dallas gambler and that's about all that they say about it and um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to take that small footnote and we're going to make it into this uh, this uh, seminar on his uh, story going back to Dallas so we're going to go way back first of all he was born Lester Ben Binion back in 1904 and uh, he was a uh, from Pilot Grove, Texas, which is just north of Dallas. He was a very small, meager child, and uh, he didn't get much education. Um, by the time he was 17, he moved out of the Dallas area, out to El Paso. Um, like I said, he didn't have much education, but he did. Uh, he was trained by his father to be a horse trader, and uh, he was actually very good at it. He made a, a career, well, not a career, but he, he was doing that in El Paso. He was also uh, heavy into uh, bootlegging, and gambling. Um, supposedly he wasn't terribly proud of his time in El Paso. He didn't like to talk about it. So he uh, didn't stay there for very long. So uh, just to familiarize yourself with where we're going here, um, here's a, a map of our great Republic of Texas. We got located here in, uh, up in North Texas. We've got the Dallas with their sister Fort Worth area. Um, that's where we're going to be spending most of our time today. And, uh, you know, today, Dallas, 
quite a big city. It's the ninth largest in the, in the U.S. It's the third largest in Texas behind the great city of Houston and uh, San Antonio. But back when uh, Benny was there, it was a different place. 1922, it was at the age of 18, Benny moved there. Um, the city had about 150,000 people. Uh, not quite the metropolis it is today, but it was a big city nonetheless. Um, when he moved there, the city was under the control of Warren Diamond. He was the biggest gambler. He ran his games out of the downtown St. Regis. Um, Abinion really looked up to Diamond, and Diamond took him under his wing. He, uh, he acted as a shill for his games. He also steered in a lot of the, uh, the people that gambled. And um, as I said, Diamond took him under his wing. He taught him everything he knew. Uh, one of Diamond's biggest claim to fame is he never refused to bet, and that's something that Binion would carry with him um, throughout his life. Uh, so in 1926, uh, Benny, with Diamond's blessing, was able to run his own craps game. Uh, it was customary at the time that if you wanted to run your own game, you would pay Warren Diamond 25% of your revenues for the opportunity to have your own game. And this is also something that Binion would later use. Uh, 1930 came around. Binion was in the right place at the right time. He was one of Diamond's men. Diamond, he uh, got sick, had cancer, and committed suicide not soon after, which created a large gambling vacuum in Dallas. So in steps Benny Binion in his place. Uh, he took over Diamond's position with his partners, Ben Bickers and Earl Dalton, and they set up what's been called the uh, Southland Group, which ran out of the Southland Hotel. It said that the second floor was nothing but craps tables in every room, and um, the, a lot of action was going on there. Uh, two of the people that Penny brought in, I, uh, well, yeah, two of the people down there in the Southland group, Ivy Miller and Red Scarborough were actually uh, Binion's guys, not Diamond's guys. So the five of them were really the major partners in the Southland group. Ivy Miller, like I said, was his right-hand man and a good friend. He ordered all these chips that were delivered to the Southland Hotel. We believe most of them were probably used there. Some of them may have traveled around a little bit in Dallas, used at the other locations, but these were chips he actually ordered them from 1938, and there was a couple in 1950 that not shown. So quite a few chips went to the Southland. Um, Red Scarborough, also his friend, he ordered some more initial chips. These all went to the Southland Hotel. Earl Dalton uh, ordered these that were also delivered there. We know that these went to the Sapango Club in um, Turtle Creek, which was just north of Dallas. Um, but all these chips were delivered to the Southland. We think probably most of them were used there. And um, I mean, as you can see, I'm, I'm not sure what they were doing with all these chips, whether, you know, what they probably did is whoever was working that day would bring in his chips and they would have it or they would have different rooms. But um, what we want to take a look at just a couple chips and what we think we understand about them, which is probably not a lot. Um, they're all well, there's a couple that aren't, but they're mostly initial chips. For instance, on this, we've got um, the four guys up top, and we know that a B, we, prob we think that's probably Ben Bickers. Um, some people say it's Binion, but really Binion's name would be on all these because he's, he's he had a piece of all the action. So that's probably Bickers. We've got M for Miller. We've got a, a Scarborough. We've got a Dalton. We think that's probably what these chips mean, um, you know, sometimes you have to get a little creative. You may have an E for Earl, a red for, uh, R for red, not quite sure. Some of the others, um, you know, we can do the same here, but then inevitably we're, we're getting initials that we don't know who they belong to. But, um, you know, there, these were the, the four partners and Binion, but there was obviously a ton of other people who were running games and who we're in on the action. So we don't know what all the initials mean, but we do know that they were used at the, uh, the, the Southland Hotel. 
Um, so also, you know, Benny had a couple hotels in downtown that he owned. Well, he didn't own the hotels outright, but he owned the action outright. Um, one of them, the Blue Bonnet Hotel, these are chips that were delivered there. Uh, Cheek ran the game at the uh, Blue Bonnet Hotel. Uh, the St. George was um, run by Jack Darby. He was a Dallas-Fort Worth tough guy. Um, the Maurice, Maurice Hotel had a few chips. Those were run by uh, James Worsham. Um, we think probably this W and B here is probably Worsham and Binion, although that B could be something else, we're not sure. Um, so quite a, quite a few chips um, used at these establishments. And, um, but what we have is we do have other people who ran games in Dallas, and they, Benny would allow them to run independent from him as long as you got his blessing and you were in on what he would do as a split. The operator would get 75% of the revenue, Benny would take 25% off the top. And for that, the, uh, the benefits, of course, well, of course, the first benefit is you're not uh, hacking off Benny Benyon, which could be bad for your health, but there were some actual real good benefits. One of them, you would get protection from hijacking. And uh, this was actually a real thing that happened in these clubs where you have a bunch of people with a lot of money in one place, and you have some guys come in and would rob it, and you know, what are you gonna do? You can't really call the police. So most of these crimes were, uh, were punished privately. And uh, the protection that you got for being associated with Benny was worth it when it came to this. You, you felt like you were, you were safe from, uh, from most hijackings. Uh, another thing, you had uh, relief from uh, police harassment, which was another um, big benefit they would have. What most of the time this would involve are what they would call controlled raids. Um, you know, at the time, not everyone liked the illegal gambling in Dallas. So every once in a while, the police would have to show that they were you know, concerned and would do something, especially during election time. Um, but how, the, how this would usually go down is these, these controlled raids. Um, the casino would be notified ahead of time that they were going to be raided. They would tell their patrons, why don't you stay home today? They would bring in a group of people that would be there gambling. When they showed up, police would bust in. Everyone would get about a 10 to $20 fine. The operators would get about a $100, $150 fine, and they'd go on their way. Um, this was kind of a, an indirect tax that Dallas would put on their, um, their gambling. They would, at one time, they were doing about 200 grand a year in fines. Uh, Benny had said at one time he had paid over $600,000 in gambling fines in Dallas. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but the biggest thing that would happen in this is the equipment uh, would not be seized. And that was one of the biggest problems that these casinos would have. I mean, fines are nothing, and these guys did you know, time without even blinking, but you'd go in and chop up their craps tables and, you know, burn their roulette tables, and that was an actual cost to them. And so, if you're friends with Benny, you'd get raided, but you'd be back up and running in no time. Uh, the third thing, then, you would get the use of Benny's government friends, uh, you know, mostly judicial people. Um, if you were a friend with Benny, not only were you protected from gambling, but you roughed up maybe some pa pa uh, some patrons, or you know, you some liquor was found on your premise. You call in Benny's friends, and uh, you'd get taken care of. So that's what you get for your 25 percent, which is actually, you know, usually that's a good thing. Um, what we're going to see here is an example: Jefferson Hotel. These chips, uh, I just found these uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, they're AR chips. They were ordered by Johnny Andrews and they went to the Hotel Jefferson. Um, what I found when I was researching this is these, uh, well, the, the AR is for uh, Johnny Andrews and his partner, uh, Jerry Rosenberg. Um, what we found was a story of what happens when this doesn't work. And uh, these guys were in business with Benny. They were given him his 25% and they figured they were protected. but. Um, Unfortunately for them, what happened is a year after those chips were um, 
ordered. They had an unannounced raid. Someone had forgotten to warn them that the police were coming. And um, in it, so instead of just the dozen or so gamblers, they came in, the place was packed. It was full of uh, people, a lot of them women. Um, and unfortunately for them, with the police was a reporter who you know, was just tagging along. And of course, he was supposed to be writing stories about um, you know, the police were cracking down on gambling. And it's supposed to be a feel-good story. But unfortunately, what came out is that two judges were found gambling <laughs> in, in the casino, which, of course, was a public relations disaster. Um, all the good citizens you know, immediately said that they wanted a grand jury. They wanted to shut this down. And uh, it was actually a big problem. So, of course, a grand jury was called, and um, it was actually done very quickly. In a couple of weeks, they came back with uh, a report that they found no evidence of. of, <laughs> of um, at the bottom, you say, according to rumors, those two judges had given false names and paid their ten dollars and you were know, gone. So this was an example. I mean, this could have really been a lot of trouble for them if, if this had come out and they had really started to crack down. So they kind of, everyone had a collective sigh in the gambling. Um, okay, another big thing for uh, Benny was he controlled all the policy racket in Dallas. Um, for those of you not familiar, policy is, you know, it's also called the numbers game. It's really just a, a lottery system. Uh, it was played mostly in poor neighborhoods and it worked as you would pick three numbers and you could bet any amount of money, even down to one penny. And uh, the payoff's usually around 600 to one. Um, you know, with three numbers, it's actually a thousand to one is your, um, your actual odds. So this was a huge money maker for, um, the, for Benny. Uh, how it's played, this is an example of a, 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 lot, a, a policy ticket. It, someone would just run around to the neighborhoods and he would just take action. He'd write down the numbers and um, then each day or sometimes multiple times a day, they would have some kind of drawing. You could do it one of two ways. Uh, one, you could actually have a physical drawing drawing which would use something like a, a cage or or a, you know just something but of course the problem with having a physical place that you're doing it is it's susceptible to raids um, it's also very easy to manipulate um, if you knew that nobody picked a certain number that magically would be the number that's picked that day so it was kind of they, they didn't like to do the physical thing um, but one of the things that developed out of this is they would tie the results to something that was happening daily. So for instance, they would have something like on you know, today's race, they would say in the sixth race, we want the first decimal of each of the winners for the win play show. And you would have something for you know, like this 866. That's how they'd pick the number. Um, one thing about this is it's fair. You know, it's very transparent. Uh, there's nowhere to raid. so. Um, Things like this were used. I've seen it also used where you would have the, the, the you know, the, the penny place on uh, three stocks, how it, it would end that day. There's, there's all sorts of ways you, would, you could get this. And, you know, really for these policy people, it, they didn't need to cheat. I mean, the, the edge was so much in their favor that they were making tons of money. Uh, 1928, Benny uh, had opened his first policy. He was making a million dollars by the end of the year on it. And, um, but one thing Benny did is there was no competition in this. He would not allow anybody to get into the policy racket. If you wanted a craps game, you could pay him. If you wanted to get in the policy game, you got in trouble. And uh, one example, Ben Frieden was the first guy who tried to get in on the game. Uh, he had started his own policy game in a poor neighborhood in Dallas. In 1936, Benny and his friend, uh, Buddy Malone, came up on him and uh, just killed him. Ten shots. Benny, Benny actually did the shooting. Uh, he killed Friedman in his car. And um, what Benny had claimed is that uh, he shot first, uh, that Frieden had shot first. And he had a flesh wound on his arm that many think were probably self-inflicted. Um, of course, Benny and Buddy were... Uh, 
dismissed of all charges, and uh, mostly that was because the, uh, the, the one witness had disappeared before, while they were trying to try the case. Um, this wouldn't be the first time, or this, I'm sorry, this wouldn't be the last time that Benny was uh, forceful in his uh, monopoly on the, the policy racket. Sam Murray is one of the bigger players that we're going to see um, that start the whole war here. He, uh, 1930s, he had a casino out of the uh, San Apollo Hotel. Um, it's, it's right here, right next to the Fred Astaire Dance Studio. Um, he was actually in business with Benny at the time of this. He was paying his 25%. Um, he does have some chips that were delivered there. The ZZZ and these BHS chips were um, delivered to the Santa Paula. Um, the BHS could be Benny Binion. At the time, they were in business together. Um, the, uh, the H is definitely Herbert Noble, who was uh, running the game there, and then the S for Sam Murray. Um, 1938, uh, Sam was getting a little aggressive. He took over the, the horse race bookie action in Dallas, which you know, Benny wasn't too concerned with because he didn't have a whole lot of uh, activity in that. But then what happened is he turned dangerous and he uh, decided he was going to get into the policy racket as well. And um, as you can probably, as you can probably imagine, that wasn't going to turn out too well for him. He uh, was shot one day, uh, 1940. And as the story goes, Benny and his buddy Ivy Miller, who had um, ordered all those chips, were sitting in a, a cafe and they got a call to and both of them ran out of the room. They took separate directions and kind of, uh, they took separate ways around this building because they weren't sure which way uh, Sam was going to be exiting. Ivy got to him first, shot and killed him, and uh, both Benny and Ivy turned themselves in. Charges were brought up against him, but on the DA's last day in office, he dismissed him and walked out the door. So, um, so the question comes, who, who made that call to um, out Sam Murray? And what most people think is it was his manager at the Santa Paula, um, Herbert Noble, who this is the first name that really you need to keep in your mind. I know I've been hitting you with names, but these guys come and go so fast. Herbert Noble is going to be the... Uh, the arch nemesis of uh, Buddy for or, uh, Binion for his time in uh, in Dallas, so um, Herbert's the most obvious suspect, and uh, the reason is that as soon as Murray uh, was murdered, Benny or uh, Herbert Noble was given his action at the Santa Paula, so he was uh, rewarded from uh, Benny with that game. Um, of course, he was required to pay Benny his 25%, but he was given own, his own reign on it. So it was quite a, uh, quite a gift for someone who didn't have anything to do with it. Um, these are chips ordered by Herbert Noble, used at the Santa Paula Hotel. Um, but he used this time, and he really uh, expanded his empire rather quickly. 1942, he moved into the Campbell Hotel. Uh, he was doing business with a Fred Merle and a Eddie Rotten. Uh, that's the F and E on the chips. And uh, 1943, he expanded into the Majestic Hotel. And 1945, he bought the Santa Paula and uh, turned it into the uh, Dallas Airmen's Club, uh, a very nice club. We, we don't have any chips that we know about from these two places. I'm sure they're out there. We just either haven't found them or haven't identified them yet. Um, so he really grew his empire rather quickly. He started to distance himself a little bit from Benny, as, as you would, thinking you're your own man now, which you know, isn't probably going to uh, sit well. Um, it was suspected that Noble was holding out a little bit of his earnings. And uh, again, that's not something you want to you wanna do for uh, your health. So what happens is we get a break from the two. The, the relationship between Benny and uh, Herbert starts to sour. And uh, one of the things that sets, sets it off is yet another man who decides he's going to enter the policy racket in Dallas. <clears throat> now, what a, uh, Raymond Laudermill 
enters very reluctantly. He didn't want to do it. He, he'd known what happened. Um, rumor has it he was talked into it by his wife, who just so happened to be the widow of the last man that Benny killed for entering the Pauzer racket. So this, this guy, yeah, Luttermilk made two big mistakes. I think the first one is marrying this widow. The second is getting in the business. So, of course, as, as you can probably guess, uh, he's quickly dispatched. Uh, Bob, a guy named Bob Maynard, who is a, a Binion associate, um, shoots a lot of milk while he's in his car. He uh, pled self-defense. He was indicted, but um, he was never tried. So as a reward, uh, Robert Minyard for, for uh, killing a lot of milk, he is given a partnership in Noble's Games, kind of a forced partnership. Noble hated the guy, and um, he knew he was there just to spy on him. And um, Binion also decided that 25% was no longer good. He wants 40% of all of Noble's action. So, you know, as you can guess, it's not going to sit well. The uh, final straw, the Maurice Hotel, which had a huge game in it, and Noble had a little piece of that, uh, was being condemned. And Benny said, you know, we're going to move everything to the Blue Bonnet Hotel. Oh, and by the way, Noble, you're, you're not invited. And so at that point, the, uh, the city was split in half. We're going to have Benny on one side, Herbert Noble on the other. And, um, and then for good measure, Benny puts a contract out on Noble and says, you know, the war's on. So it's going to turn hot. Our first assassination, and, you know, then we're going to have now years and years of Noble as a hunted man. Um, but the first attempt here happens 1946. He's uh, pursued, he's shot at, he hides under a house. Um, he does escape, he is shot. But um, one of the people that he had identified as doing the shooting was his old partner, Bob M Minyard, who was uh, thrust upon him. Two days later, uh, Bob is shot in his driveway and um, it's said that the people who did the shooting were employees of the Dallas Airmen's Club. Of course, no arrests were made. Um, and so here we, we've got the war started and uh, you know people are dying actually rather quickly. Um, this attention for um, this, the attention of now we've got a hot war instead of just gamblers um, you know fighting it out amongst themselves is bringing attention to law enforcement. Texas Rangers come in they tried to shut it down, but every time they go in to these casinos, they're completely empty. Um, you know, obviously being tipped off. And one of the uh, people suspected of tipping them off here is uh, Sheriff Smith. He's a, a seven-time sheriff in Dallas. He was definitely in Benny's pocket. Um, as long as he was sheriff, nobody could touch Benny. So what happens? 1947, um, we get a, a we get someone against him. Herbert Noble backs Steve Guthrie. He didn't like Guthrie, but he knew that he wasn't going to be Benny's man. So we get a, a we actually get a decent runoff contest, and um, Schmidt apparently figured it was in the bag and didn't do any campaigning, nothing. Steve Guthrie comes in and he actually wins the election. Um, I do kind of like this these pictures. We got the corrupt sheriff with the Tommy gun and this clean sheriff on the uh, Honest Abe Penny. But, um, so what happens immediately, Steve Guthrie wins, they, um, and he's found that he's the worst nightmare for the gamblers because he's found that he's an honest man. He was uh, immediately approached and offered $500,000 bribe to, uh, to let gamblers do their thing, which, you know, 1946, that's a lot of money. It's probably around five million now. Um, but he turns it down. And so 1947, January 1st, he takes office and the gambling is closed off um, for the most part. I mean, there are now, there are gamblers um, who are tried and they are actually prosecuted and put in jail for the first time in Dallas history. So um, Benny decides that he's going to close some of his big places and he moves to, da um, to Las Vegas just to let the heat die down. So, you know, we're not going to spend much time in, in Vegas because I know nobody cares about Vegas. So we're going to, um, the first place that he does is he hits the Las Vegas club and uh, he runs that. But I, as I've been told, the not 
uh, many of the uh, Las Vegas people liked him so much because he was kind of reckless and, you know, an honest guy that would take any bet and he's taking money away from Las Vegas people. Um, one of his investors here, Fred Merle, is an old friend in uh, Dallas. That's a picture of the two of them at the Las Vegas club. Uh, Meyer Lansky supposedly had a piece of this, but, you know, Benny didn't like doing business like that. So quickly he, uh, he sold his shares in Las Vegas club and he uh, opened the, the Westerner kind of a Western theme or his uh, doing, but still he, he wanted that horseshoe um, casino and uh, apparently he was having trouble getting a license because of his uh, gambling activity in Dallas. Um, but meanwhile, back in Dallas, things weren't calmed down at all. Um, Benny was furious uh, that Noble was helping his competition and he got his sheriff thrown out. So he ups the ante on him and uh, his shots ring out again. Um, assassination attempt number two, he's ambushed in his car and he's shot. Uh, number three, someone spots uh, some guys underneath Noble's car. They went to look. It's filled with explosives. It's at this point that the, um, the newspapers give him the nickname The Cat because of his many lives. Um, number four, the fourth attempt, um, he's shot at in his car. He takes a bolt in the leg. Um, this is a picture of Noble in his car. It's full of bullet holes. Um, you know, he's, he's obviously on the run. Um, the fifth attempt that same year was actually pretty tragic. His um, wife uh, had borrowed his car one day, and unfortunately it was again filled with explosives. She was killed instantly. Car exploded. This was something that... Um, Obviously, Noble was just horrified with. Uh, immediately, the person who was suspected of doing this killing, um, the month later, he was uh, killed as well. And um, this was something, though, that Noble really never recovered from. Um, he starts to fall apart. He, uh, he abandons his house, and he moves into his ranch, which he turns into pretty much a fortress. It was, had floodlights and alarms. and. Um, he takes drugs all night to stay awake, and then he has to take more drugs in the morning to sleep. Uh, and then the weirdest thing is he buys six little chihuahuas and parrots and teaches them to just go nuts at any sound. So that's, his alarm system is, is a bunch of animals. And apparently it worked, at least as he's at the house. Um, so real quick, I, I said that Benny closed down a lot of his casinos. He did have other action around Dallas. Um, the Topo Hill Terrace is actually a pretty famous place. Uh, Arlington is right outside of Dallas. Um, you know, Arlington, home of the Dallas Cowboys, the, uh, the evil Dallas Cowboys. Um, Fred Browning was the owner of this. He was an uh, avid, um, he, he loved to bet on the horses, but apparently he was really bad at it. He got up a lot of debt. Benny came in, bailed him out for a piece of the action. So Benny actually filled the Topo Hill Terrace with all his, all his guys. Um, Ivy Miller, was, he ran the, the dice games there. Um, Andrews and, uh, and uh, Rosenberg from the Jefferson, they also ran a lot of the games there. Um, now this place is still open today and they do tours. It's owned by um, some Bible school now and uh, they'll do tours about the illegal gambling. It's kind of kind of funny. Um, the, the action happened in the basement and they had a tunnel that went from the basement out the hill and out the back and this was their escape plan for raids. And uh, one story goes that there was a, a big night and they're all gambling and they have a guy down there with a broken leg and a giant cast and as the cops came in they all funneled through this tunnel which is really narrow. He gets jammed in there and uh, bottlenecks and all these people got arrested because this one guy got jammed in with his leg. So, um, so that actually, I mean, that actually happened though. That was a, that was their escape route. And um, so another thing, Dallas, Fort Worth area. Um, the thing with Fort Worth is they were pretty jealous. Um, they got kind of jealous about all the money that Dallas was making. So they wanted gambling of their own, but they did not want all the violence that was going along with the Dallas. 
So they said, okay, you guys can open casinos, but only Fort Worth people are allowed to run them. So we get two factions that start. We got Tiffin Hall on one side and uh, Nelson Harris on the other. But what we really have is Benny Binion backing Tiffin and we've got Herbert Noble on Nelson Harris' side behind the scenes. I mean, it's obviously gonna happen and they must have known it. Um, but if you were gonna have a, a partner, who do you think you'd want? Well, we're about to find out what happens. Um, a club in Fort Worth, the East Side Club, was owned by George Wilderspin, who was a good friend of Benny. Uh, they grew up together and were on the rodeo circuit. George, I, one, one story about him, he, he only spent one night in jail and that was um, when he was in Yellowstone National Park. He uh, was, was trick roping the bears out there and they arrested him. So he never spent any time for gambling, but he, uh, he ran the Eastside Club and he was the, uh, the gatekeeper for all of the Fort Worth action for, um, for Benny Benyon. Well, what happens in uh, 1950 is Nelson Harris, who was with Noble, decides he's gonna rob the Eastside Club and goes in, robs it, which obviously isn't gonna be a good idea. Um, the next day, or very soon after, Nelson is exploded in his car. Uh, unfortunately, his very pregnant wife was also in the car, which kind of put a, a damper on the whole affair. And the police came, or the, the, the cops kind of started cracking down. But this is what happens when you um, go against Benny. There's, there's a whole history with um, Fort Worth that's really actually terribly interesting, but you know, we're not gonna get into it here. Um, but they had their, their own, you know, wars back there too. Is, um, it's very interesting, we're not gonna get into it. But, so what happens is with all the press about these women dying and explosions and everything, that's too much. They're gonna start cracking down on Benny. And um, one thing that they do is they raid the small shed on Benny's his estate and what they find in there is this is his headquarters for all his policy and his gambling and they go in there and it's just filled with receipts and notes and everything about all his gambling so they gather it all up and of course um, Benny is convinced that Noble's the one that set him up and told him where to go so he ups the bounty on Noble again like you know he needed that um, but so, so Benny's gonna get in trouble, and this is, this is actually huge for him because it's gonna, it's gonna show up later and it's gonna, um, we'll get into that. So number six, Noble, again, he's shot while standing by his front door. He takes a bullet in the arm. Um, I'm calling this number six. There's actually a few things that happened before this that he's threatened and he talks his way out. Um, I mean, the, the guy is, you know, he's, he's invincible apparently at this point. A week later, while he's in the jail, someone outside, or while, he, while he's in um, the hospital, someone outside takes a pot shot, a sniper shoots through and the bullet hole goes into the ceiling. This is a week later, as he's sitting in the hospital. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, as a side note, I, these guys, I, they're made of sterner stuff, because I mean, how many times would you have to get shot or before you just say, you know, I'm getting out of here. I mean, I, I don't understand it. Uh, assassination attempt number eight happens rather quickly after that. Noble's an uh, amateur pilot. He um, gets in his plane one day and the engine blows up and they go in and look and it was filled with nitroglycerin. Uh, you know, fortunately for him, those planes are built pretty tough. Um, the, uh, the, uh, and he, he didn't actually get hurt himself, it destroyed his plane, but he uh, was unharmed. And then, uh, as you know, with cats, they get nine lives. So assassination attempt number nine, his luck's gonna finally run out. Uh, this drawing here is from the police sketch of what happened that day. Uh, what, um, what happens is Noble, he's driving home and uh, he, whoops, hello, hold on. He, uh, He's driving home and he checks his mailbox that day, 
Well, what he didn't know is that 60 yards away, staked out here, he's got some guys who had set up a wire all the way to his mailbox that was packed with explosives. When they saw he, uh, he got to the uh, mailbox, which was over here, this is, the, this is a, um, a police who is investigating it. They grounded the wire and it blew up Noble and his car. So they finally got him. It took, it took nine real attempts, but Noble is finally put down. Um, of course, the police had plenty of suspects in, in Dallas who were, uh, who they figured were doing it. Some of the guys, you know, suddenly flush with money and spending it freely. So they figured they probably got the bounty on him. Um, Benny, of course, was asked what he thought about it, and he denied anything and just, you know, said he hated it. Um, but then again, years later in an interview, he was quoted as saying, um, they said he had nine lives, good thing he didn't have ten. So it doesn't seem like he was terribly uh, upset about it. Um, as a side note, the feds did say that whoever did this would, uh, could face up to three years in jail for blowing up a federal mailbox. So <laughs> you better watch out for that. Um, so he took care of his problem in Dallas. So uh, Benny is now going to concentrate on Las Vegas. Uh, one thing, Benny, I know everyone thinks he is, you know, the, the Las Vegas guy. He always wanted to go home. He, he loved Dallas. He, his family was there, his, uh, his friends, he had a great business, but there was always something keeping him away. And um, so in the meantime, he was going to stay in, in uh, Las Vegas while he was having issues. He uh, bought the um, El Dorado. He converts it into his horseshoe. Um, as I said before, he was having licensing trouble. Um, they wouldn't give him a, a gaming license, so he was the manager of the restaurant here. Of course, he was running the show. Um, his lawyers finally argued that the reason he wasn't getting the license was because he had illegal gambling in Texas. But then they said, well, you have to uphold Nevada laws, and Nevada allows gambling. Therefore, you shouldn't hold that against them. And so uh, eventually, with what they suspect to be some large bribes, he did get his license and um, he was running the show. But like I said before, uh, that, that raid on his stables uh, was actually pretty devastating. Uh, all, the, uh, all the evidence they had on his gambling action in Dallas um, stacked up on him and the federal courts told him he had to go back to Texas to, uh, to face his, um, his charges. 1953, he comes back, he stands trial. Um, the, the state says they have a whole bunch of evidence against him. Do you want to plea out or do you want to go to court? He decides to take the plea. He takes five different counts, four years consecutive, uh, to run consecutive, and um, he's sent off to jail. Later, the prosecutor had, uh, had said that actually they didn't really have much evidence at all against him and they were actually glad he took that plea. When Benny found that out, of course, he was furious with himself and with his lawyers. So Benny has to transfer the horseshoe. He transfers it to his friend Joe W. Brown. He's a um, gambler out of New Orleans. He ran uh, the, the Highlight Club there. Here's some chips from the Highlight New Orleans Club um, matchbook. Uh, old Joe Brown there. He, um, he really took to Las Vegas. and. Uh, really enjoyed his time here. Of course, what he does is he brands everything himself. He, I mean, he knew this was a temporary arrangement. I mean, uh, Benyon sold this to him knowing he'd get it back eventually, but I think Joe had a little fun with it. He uh, puts his name above all the horseshoe. He takes all the Benyon chips and scratches off the, the Indian, I guess, the, the, B, the B still works. I don't, know, it's, I don't know if there's any chips that don't, doesn't have the scratched off. I, are there any examples I've seen nothing but these scratched off chips. Um, I guess if you're cheap enough to reuse chips, I don't know, it seems like a lot of work to just sit there and whittle these chips away. But um, So, you know, eventually Benny does his time. Four years later he gets out and um, he's got to make a decision. Is Should he go back to Dallas now that he's got a clear record, he can go back, no problem. 
or should he go back to Las Vegas? Um, of course, Dallas, the pros are that, you know, he had friends there. Uh, pretty much all of his enemies were dead by now, by, mostly by his own hand. Um, but of course, Dallas had kind of moved on from the gambling. I mean, Las Vegas was the popular place now when it came to gambling. And uh, his choice really was an easy one, especially when you look back on it. Um, he was going to have to go back to Las Vegas if he, if he was going to stay in the gambling business. And so what you get is the cowboy returns to Las Vegas. He gets back his horseshoe. Um, and of course, he becomes the, you know, the, the cowboy uh, that everyone loves. Um, let's see. Well, of course, you know, Benny's legacy. I think most people who are into gambling, they know Benny. I mean, he creates a World Series of Poker. His horseshoe brand goes across the country. It's in riverboats now. And, uh, you know, he becomes a Las Vegas legacy and, and, and legend. Of course, you know, that's probably mostly due to the fact that, you know, history is written by the victors. If he had, you know, if he had toiled away in prison or had been shot in, in Dallas, we probably wouldn't even know him today. He'd be just another guy that we're writing about in our illegal of the days. Um, but of course he does become the man. Um, two books that I think are really good references. Uh, Blood Aces is um, a really good one. Um, it's actually been optioned for a movie, so that may come out. That would be pretty interesting. I'll do my own damn killing. Uh, great story, or a, a great title. Uh, both books pretty much talk about the same thing, so I wouldn't recommend reading both of them because you're going to be reading a lot of the same stuff. Um, I think Blood Aces may be a little better, but uh, they're both really good reads. And um, one thing I wanted to end up, you know, that, that, that uh, statue downstairs from the, um, down in the lobby is actually Benny Benny, and I don't know if anyone's taken a look at it. Um, it's been well traveled. I don't know if, if anyone knows anything about this. Um, it started life in Fort Worth. Um, this, this place, Billy Bob, Texas, is kind of a, a giant inside rodeo. It's 127,000 square feet of just uh, dance floors and bars, and they actually have a, a tiny, um, they have a, a, a tiny little area where they have bull rides in there, and like real bulls. They've never had a mechanical bull in there, and they say they never will. But at, for 150 grand, Billy Bob uh, Barnett was a friend of uh, Binion, and he made that statue downstairs at his own expense, put it out front. I haven't seen any pictures of it. I don't think it was there for very long. Um, 1988, it was moved to downtown Las Vegas, close to the, um, it, was, it was close to the horseshoe, um, and Benny was there for the induction, and, uh, and then 20 years later, uh, the South Point bought it, uh, reportedly maybe for a dollar just to get it somewhere out. I think it was being neglected, and uh, now it's sitting downstairs, so that's old Benny, and um, that's all I got for, for Benny. Uh, it was about 45 minutes, so thank you. So I don't know um, if we want to open up questions for just illegals in general. I know we got most of the, uh, the big guys here. Um, if I can't answer it, maybe we can uh, get someone else to speak up. But um, so any general questions? Some of the chips you contributed to certain clubs of people, were they found in that area so you can actually easily identify them? No, all the chips that I show here, if I put it with a hotel, they were delivered to that hotel. We have the records for that. Um, I'm sure there are a lot more that we haven't attributed. And, and like I said, all those that went to the, the Southland may have not been used at the Southland. They may have been used at other hotels, but the Southland wasn't the only place they had them delivered. If, I thought if that was maybe the one place they, we could say they were used elsewhere, but all of those were examples of um, chips that we've identified through the records. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
I can repeat it too. Who's got the question? Ed, a lot of the uh, chips that you referenced were hub modes, mm -hmm. masons. Uh, how soon do you think we'll be able to get access to those? You know, we, we can go to you or, yeah. or Gene now, but <clears throat> when I, can we get public access to them? The access to the, the mason molds, I mean, I, I don't own them. Um, I have use for some of them, uh, but I'm not the one that makes that call. I, I don't know. I know they've, they're have they kind of in limbo right now, but um, I'm not the one to answer that. I, I don't know. I don't know when they'll be public. Sorry. How do you uh, Ed, uh, oh, is this particular uh, set of slides presentation available on uh, a computer somewhere, um, will, or will you they be, will be putting yeah. it on there? Yeah, I'll, I'll contact the uh, the club and see if we can put it somewhere, or I'll, I'll have a link something, or you can you know email me, or yeah, I'll make them available. Great, thank you. Yeah. Howard. Uh, the American Gaming Archives at the Nevada Historical Society has all of the hub mold cards and they're going to be available publicly in a matter of uh, hopefully a short period of time getting them indexed and put on onto a uh, computerized situation is, is, is the process they're going through right now. Well, there you go. That'll be nice. Just curious if there was any uh, organized crime involvement in Dallas uh, during this period of time that you were talking about, and if not, why not? Since they were in uh, you know a number of other cities, east, east and west, and even central part of the U.S. There's actually um, there's been many stories of groups coming down. I know the Chicago outfit supposedly came down, and um, you know they'll. You see this in a lot of places, is they'll come down, they'll kind of feel the place out, and a lot of stories is they're pushed out. I know Galveston was the same way. They had kind of a crime syndicate there, their own. You know, it wasn't, it was the Maceos down there, and they had people come in to say they wanted to muscle in, and you muscle them out of town. I think the same thing happened here. There's a couple stories of a couple groups coming in, and Benny and his boys said that probably wouldn't be a good idea. So. You know, you say organized crime. I mean, this was organized crime. I mean, this, it wasn't the Chicago outfit or the Cleveland or, or those big groups, but, you know, Benny certainly was running the town like you know, organized crime. But uh, there, there were some instances where guys tried to come in and were told to leave. Yeah, Ed? Yeah. Uh, where's Benny Binion buried at? Say that again? Where's he buried at? Where's Benny Binion buried at? <sighs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. Anyone know? Yeah, I, I would guess that. I mean, Las Vegas kind of you know, took him as their son. It could take him back to his ranch. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. He had a, a ranch in Montana, so um, yeah, it would probably be pretty easy to find out. I see John's probably uh, googling right now. Um, but, you know, Las Vegas took him as their son, and, and really, as I, I said, Benny loved Texas, and he loved Montana, his ranch, but uh, Las Vegas kind of took him on, and I think that's because that's where he ended his career, and, you know, he became kind of this, this larger-than-life character. You know, he doesn't have to shoot people when he's in Las Vegas, so he's looked upon as this, this jolly guy that walks through the casinos. I mean, in contrast, do you think... Like Bugsy Siegel was a Las Vegas legend as well, but when he died, everyone was like, you know, uh, that guy was nuts. We don't you know, want anything to do with him. But Benny, you still hear people say, oh, I walked through the casino and he was there, he shook my hand and it was great. So I think, again, like I said, you know, the, because he was able to end his life, you know, being this grandpa of Vegas, 
he's looked upon in, in a great light, and his Dallas days are just kind of mentioned a little bit on the side, just, you know, a Dallas gambler, and that's it. And you don't see that, I mean, there's a lot of blood and, you know, a lot of chaos from those times. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to speculate. Um, the, uh, the molds were pr proprietary um, for, for most chips. Um, on the hot stamp dies, I've noticed particular uh, die styles, uh, letter font styles for different distributors or chip makers. Do, do you have an opinion on that, whether um, the actual die stamps were made proprietary for a distributor? Well, I know, you know, how do you be the one to answer about questions about chip manufacturing? Um, I think for most of these initial chips, they're not going to be proprietary. Well, the, the initial may be proprietary, but they're not, I don't think, owning the die for it, are they? They're just, they're just stamping those out, right? Jason had five different die styles they used on their hot stamp chips and their chips. Right. Right, so I mean the, the, the MBD from the, the chip wouldn't, I mean they wouldn't have a stamp like with MBD, it would be just they, they would put that together, stamp them out and then disassemble those I think. Yeah, right? they would yeah. just simply mix the individual letters together and they, would, they, were, they did maintain cards so that they didn't give the same die style. Uh, you could have, if, if you had something in Detroit style, you they wouldn't use it, again. they'd give another person the same initials, but it might be in Chicago, a different, uh, different font. But the question is, did any other distributors have that die style? Or did they Anybody could get the die, dies, you got them from Kinsley Hot Stamping Company. But the distributors themselves were pretty careful not to mix things up because they didn't want to be accused of running, helping somebody run something in. Oh, he's buried in Las Vegas. All right. Um, so, oh, yeah, well, go ahead. While Benny was in the Las Vegas, didn't Noble try to pack his airplane full of explosives? He did. Um, I, I, I just neglected to put that in. I was thinking about that this morning. He did. He, he packed his, well, of course, this is after his wife was, was murdered. He was going crazy. He uh, packed his little plane full of explosives. Someone gave him a map of Las Vegas with Benny's house circled on it, and he was going to fly there. Um, it was going to be tough. He, he would have to land and uh, refuel at some point, and, but he was, of course, out of his mind. Someone dropped a, a dime to, to Benny. He packed up his family, and they hit it out of town when he heard about this. And um, I can't remember if it was the sheriff or, or who talked Noble out of this crazy idea. I mean, I, I don't think he would even, he'd probably be having to throw that stuff out of the side of the plane or he would just crash it right into the house. He was that crazy at the time. But um, that was, yeah, that was one time that he almost tried to get back at, at Benny. But most of the time, you know, Benny's sitting here, Noble, like I said, he's, he's, he's a hunted man. He's like, like a guy in duck hunt that just was getting shot constantly. I, I just can't, I can't imagine how he lived like that, just constantly. Anybody else? Um, I just want to make one announcement. I think um, we've been trying for years to get some kind of illegal website chip thing happening, and I've been talking about it for years, but. You know, I don't have the time or really the expertise anymore to do it. Uh, my good friend John Winslow has decided to come back in the hobby full force, and he's uh, hired his, well, he's, I think, ordered his daughter to uh, help us design a website f with her company. So uh, look for that in the next, you know, year or so. We're going to try to get that off the ground. Kind of, we're not quite sure what it'll look like. We were kind of maybe a wiki type thing where it could be um, crowdsourced a little bit for information. It'd be you know, chips. We wanted some, you know, depository for all this history that we're coming up with. You know, we, we you know, Gene's been real good with posting all this illegal of the day, 
And uh, the problem is, you know, that stuff scrolls away, and even though we've got it in a few places, it's, there's really not one place to go to find all this illegal history. So we're going to try to get one place where we can all go to get all this information. So uh, we'll be working on that in, uh, hopefully soon. But I'm always asked that, and so I thought I'd, I'd bring that up before someone scolded me for not doing that already. So. Is that it? Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you.